Recently, my father told me that when my siblings and I were growing up that he didn't really enjoy being a father and that he was waiting for us to grow up. That my childhood and his fatherhood was something that he endured that he just had to get through. And it's also the way he approached life. And one of the lessons he taught me was that life itself was something to be endured, to be tolerated, to be gotten through. And because of that, I heard a lot of messages either directly as a teaching or indirectly through his behaviors, his actions, the way he lived his life, um, to keep your head down, don't make a lot of noise, don't complain, be quiet, certainly not to express your emotions, because to do that would draw consequences maybe the strength of his hand or the intimidation of his voice or ridicule. And it made sense to me now that I look back and I understand him better. He grew up in a Korea that was occupied by Japan under the under a 35-year Japanese occupation. His parents were born under that. And as you can imagine, that meant a constant suppression of Korean culture, Korean language. Just being Korean wasn't good enough. And so he did learn to hide, to keep his head down, to stay safe, to survive. One of the uh, consequences of that for me was that I learned to do that myself. And I always knew that I wanted to be an artist. This is something I just knew as a child in my bones. And there was one day when I was around 10 or 11 years old when my parents sat me down to have a talk to let me know that this artist thing really isn't a good idea. And to be an artist, you have to be kind of a genius. <laughs> and you have to be basically committing yourself to a life of suffering and starvation, and you're going to end up living under a bridge, <laughs> that's what I like to say. And sadly, I believed him. And this wasn't the first time I heard this message. This was the sit down to hear the message because I really needed to hear the message. And, uh, and so I went inward. I gave up on that part of myself at a young age. And really turned my energy into sports. And sports was the one place where I could escape from myself from my feelings of depression and melancholy and having lost that dream. But I found it in other ways. I found this way of being, of losing my self-consciousness, of joining in with the group, working together, being in the moment with my teammates, with my opponents, and pushing my body to extremes. And for athletes, endurance is a, a very, it makes a lot of sense. We, all athletes understand that to grow and to, um, to make progress, one must endure physical pain. One must push up against the edges of one's physical limits. 
And so I embraced this practice. I love to go out and run until my legs were on fire. I love to see how far could I run, how fast could I run, and how long could I endure that kind of pain and discomfort. And I found myself as an athlete in my 20s. And then as I got into my late 20s and I still hadn't found that creative voice inside of me, it started to speak. It started to sort of make itself known to me in the form of a different kind of pain, more of an emotional pain. Something's hurting inside of me and I don't know what it is. And Around age 26, I, I couldn't bear that pain any longer. And I decided I was going to do it. I was going to find out what it is to be an artist. I didn't know. And as I began to find that first inkling of my artistic voice, I was just trying to bring all the parts of myself to that conversation. And the first and most natural place that showed up for that was sports. Although, to be truly honest, I, didn't, I hesitated to bring that in. I brought in this way of working with drawing, with working with painting that was very physical. I knew that physicality was so important to me and pushing my body to these extremes and these limits was very important to me. But I found myself in, uh, in graduate school in my MFA program and I was talking about this and showing these big drawings, these big scale drawings that were very physical. And um, my mentor said to me, you know, I can, I can hear how important this is to you, how, how much your physicality and your athleticism matters to your creative process. But I don't really believe you. And that shook me. And it caused me to go into about a two-month period of not making art, of really looking inside of myself to try to understand what he meant. And it was a period of darkness and a period of unknown, and I was journaling, and it was in the middle of winter too, so it was literally dark and cold and raining, just like <laughs> what we're about to face here. And coming out of that was nothing more than an enduring, a way of enduring that unknown and a decision to endure that unknown and be in that discomfort, be in that, I, I don't know who I am in this conversation anymore. But when I did finally come out of it, it was a way of combining, basically it was a coming back to the playful decision-making of the child. What sounds fun? I'm just going to combine sports and art, and I'm going to mash them together in as many ways as I can and see what happens. And so I want to share with you just a small sampling of that work first.
So it was a great liberation to find this, this voice inside of me, this way of expressing myself that seemed to combine these really important elements of my own experience together. It was very freeing. And as I did this for a number of years, I began to feel another kind of pain bubbling up within me. I was, I was getting pretty good at, or it was becoming more comfortable for me to be in physical pain. I understood that in a really clear way, but I didn't understand this new emotional pain that was coming up. And what that was, was a realization that I did not know my own voice. And learning, growing up in my family, I learned that speaking itself was dangerous. So that my, the way that I responded to the, those threats, those dangers, the occasional violence that happened in my family was to suppress that voice and to stuff it inside. And I knew that I had this expressive thing that was happening out in the world, but I didn't know how to talk about it. I didn't know how to talk about what else was in there. And in 2016, when Trump was elected, I and many of the people in my community felt a great sense of despair, a great sense of something is broken and a sense of helplessness and hopelessness. And myself and a friend of mine, Mel Day, who's another artist, we decided we wanted to respond somehow artistically. We wanted to do something to mobilize ourselves, to mobilize others. And we, together we created, a, we created an app. And that app was something that we shared with people, everyone that we knew, and we asked them to sing. Now, Leonard Cohen, you might remember, died at that same time. He died, I think, the day before the election, but it was announced a couple days after. And this was another sh shot in the gut to lose that voice. But we chose this song, Hallelujah, as a way of giving voice to that pain and that despair, while also giving voice to the hope in the spirit of humanity, the, the desire for something more exalted, the broken and the holy. And I don't know about you all, but for me to sing in public, to have other people hear my cracked voice was one of the most scary things I could think of. And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to play it for you I'm going to invite you to sing along. The words will be up here, kind of karaoke style, and it will mimic the, what we ask people to do. We ask people to do this, and they did that in, their, in the privacy of their own spaces. So they did it by themselves, but we overlaid all the video and the audio together to create this over 100-person chorus. And we took this performance to places like Grace Cathedral, San Francisco, where we had people sing together in these mass singing events. And most importantly, we took it to Washington DC on inauguration day and projected it on the side of a building just outside of Potomac Station and blasted the sound of these voices from the rooftops. So I wanna invite you to bring that part of yourselves that probably feels uncomfortable singing in public with people around you and invite you to sit in that discomfort, to be that, to bring that courageous part of you forward and join me in song. Hallelujah.
complexity of our own contradictory emotions and can we speak from there can we sing from there I'll share with you one um, other little story here and I'll actually have this play while I do it um, I right before that time um, I'd broken my hand. I'd broken a bunch of bones, but I'd just broken my hand in a couple places and had surgery, and I was very incapacitated for quite a while. And in enduring the pain or the discomfort and dissatisfaction of not being able to write, to draw, to use this, my dominant hand, I decided I wanted to learn to write with my left hand. And so I began that process of just slowly, like a child, learning to pick up a pencil for the first time and struggling through forming letters and forming words and trying writing four words. And I really, really got to understand how left-handers experience the world for a little bit, this sort of pushing across the body and the covering up of the words and the smearing and the not 
all the ways that it's, it's unnatural to write from left to right for a left-hander. But something amazing happened during this time of not knowing and struggle, which is that in forcing myself to slow down, to be very deliberate, and to pay close attention to what I was doing, I found that my mind slowed down. And the words themselves began to pass through my body in this much slower way, in this way that I could kind of marinate in them. And I began to understand language in a different way. Not in this fast way I had to get everything down and you know, capture it all, or the way that I was conditioned to do with my right hand, but in this way that was more patient and slow and meaningful. And it was from this very act of the, the struggle of forming words for the first time that a new voice inside of me was born. This is the first time I started writing poetry. And so I want to offer that any kind of darkness that you find yourself in, any kind of pain and injury, it's not the only thing that's there. There's other, there's other gifts lying below the surface if we're open to them, if we can endure that struggle, if we can endure that pain and still move through it anyway. The last thing I want to share with you is a... Um, leave you with a, a poem, not my own, but a poem by Mary Oliver. Called The Journey. Oh. Is that my computer doing that? <laughs> or can we shut the screen? We don't need the screen anymore. Kill the projector. Okay. Close the curtains. Close the curtains, yeah. Well, they would still project on the curtains, right? Yeah. <laughs> I want to um, suggest that the greatest form of endurance is the dedication and the persistence and the discipline of listening to yourself, of staying in tune with that inner voice, with the inner vision, with your heart. Because there's going to be voices all around you that are always trying to tell you something different. And so that enduring way that we can stake the, the, the discipline of staying in endurance with yourself is the greatest and most difficult and most rewarding and most enjoyable aspect of life. <laughs> to be in tune with yourself, your own, and it's your own pain, your own joys and your own struggles.
One day, you finally knew what you had to do and began, though the voices around you kept shouting their bad advice. Though the whole house began to tremble and you felt the old tug at your ankles, mend my life, each voice cried. But you didn't stop. You knew what you had to do. Though the wind pried with its stiff fingers at the very foundations, though their melancholy was terrible, it was already late enough and a wild night in the road full of fallen branches and stones. But little by little, as you left their voices behind, the stars began to burn through sheets of clouds, and there was a new voice which you slowly recognized as your own, that kept you company as you strode deeper and deeper into the world, determined to do the only thing you could do, determined to save the only life you could save. When I instruct people to do these exercises, I always say that the idea is to get your body into a place of discomfort and to push and to explore that edge of discomfort and to watch it slowly turn into pain and to sit with that, to not run from it. In this exercise, I always say, see how far you can go. See if you can get out to that edge when you feel like stopping and see if you can make one more line, one more line, one more line. Can you stay with it? This is the first time I've done this exercise and spoken at the same time. So I don't really know what I'm going to say. <laughs> the, po the poem's over. <laughs> but somehow, I want to dedicate myself to this space of being in discomfort, of pushing myself and staying with you, and letting you know what's going on inside of me. Like the burning that's beginning to grow in my quadriceps and the mounting discomfort in my shoulders. And the knowing that as I get out to that edge, it's going to hurt. Now, when I do these kinds of things, I know that it can be difficult to watch sometimes for some of you. It's hard to bear witness 
to someone who's struggling, to someone in pain. So I also want you to know that I'm safe. I'm okay. It's just that it hurts. It's hurting more now. I can see that this stage is not large enough. for you, how, how you're feeling. It's getting, it's getting harder to speak. Part of me wants to say, don't try this at home. <laughs> but another, another part of me says, try this at home. get dressed now <laughs> but I think we're moving into um, questions. questions sure yeah what's that 
Yes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Thank you for sharing your story and um, one by But one one thing is that I'm watching throughout the entire thing, uh, especially this performance. I'm wondering what your relation to like empathy is because it's really tough to yeah. watch you do this, and it sounds like you teach others to do this sort of thing. So yeah. How does this? Yeah, what does that play with like endurance, and pain, and then? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> I think um, we, we can easily um, understand what we mean by physical strength, right? but I don't think um, we usually think about emotions or emotional strength. And I think to really be, to have empathy means to sustain feeling especially when it's hard, especially when it hurts. So I like to think that there's, whether we're talking about physical pain or emotional pain, the, the discipline is the same. The discipline is, can I stay with it? Can I stay with my experience and the experience of the other? I don't know if there's any. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Wow. There's a few questions in there, and they're really good. Um, uh, so you might need to remind me. As I, but first of all, yeah, my uh, mentor was very, was, was elated to see the, um, the way that I uncovered something new, discovered something.